Hi friends, Father Kerry Walters here, pastor of Holy Spirit American National Catholic Church, and this is another Holy Spirit moment. This one reflecting on the question of whether or not the Anglo-Saxon hero Beowulf is a Christ-like figure. Christ-like figures abound in Western literature and these days in movies. A Christ-like figure is someone who has certain characteristics uh, that remind us of the characteristics and the teachings of Christ as recorded in the four Gospels. Now, because these are Christ-like figures instead of Christ himself, they also can carry other sorts of characteristics that don't seem particularly compatible with Christ. But so long as the Christ-like qualities that they do display outweigh the other qualities, we are warranted in seeing them as figures who somehow are empowered with the Spirit of Christ such that they are Christ-like. Now the question before us is whether or not the hero Beowulf uh, is a Christ-like figure. In popular culture, in movies and in comic books and even in a few novels, Beowulf, this Anglo-Saxon warrior, is depicted as nothing more than a kind of swashbuckler who goes through life killing monsters. There's some truth to that if one reads the original saga, but I want to suggest to you that Beowulf is much, much more than simply a sword-wielding warrior. And the reason for that, I suspect, is the circumstance of uh, the uh, way in which the manuscript Beowulf uh, was written. Probably uh, the manuscript was written sometime in A.D. 700 to A.D. 1000. It purports, however, to tell a much older tale, a tale before Christianity had come to the Scandinavian countries. The story was almost certainly written by a Christian monk who was also a wonderful, wonderful poet. And so you see in this manuscript a wonderful and sometimes um, dizzying amalgamation of pagan images and themes and Christian images and themes. For example, on the pagan side, there's a great deal of emphasis upon doom or fate, which is not at all the same as Christian providence. But on the Christian side of things, you see so many hints that Beowulf is being depicted by the Christian poet as a Christ-like figure that they are hard to overlook. Let me explain what I mean uh, in drawing upon this wonderfully ambiguous and wonderfully poetic uh, manuscript. A manuscript, by the way, that was almost lost to us. There's only one copy of it that's ever been found. Uh, it was charred, so it clearly had survived a fire. It was found in the 18th century, and it really only came to be extremely popular uh, to the world um, in the 1930s when J.R.R. Tolkien of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings fame wrote an incredible and still canonical essay about the saga. So, one of the main characters is the monster Grendel. Grendel is a hell creature. Grendel is a spawn of Cain. He is a creature of the night who is filled with hatred and rage against everything that is good. Grendel is a representative of the evil that lurks and prowls in the world, reminding us very much of what we are told in one of the letters of Peter in the New Testament, that Satan prowls like a furious and ravenous lion seeking prey. And Grindel's particular target has been the King Hrothgar and his wonderful mead hall. Grindel sees this mead hall, a place of happiness and joy and celebration, as a stand-in for everything that he, the darkness, despises. And so he ravages through Hrothgar's mead hall on several occasions, slaying and actually consuming warrior after warrior after warrior, until finally uh, the king closes down the mead hall and it stands deserted for 12 years. It is as if a horrible darkness has descended upon the land of the Danes, uh, a, a darkness which has gutted all joy and all um, celebration, which has um, dimmed all light and all hope and all promise. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, 
a young man arrives on the shore of Denmark in order to rid, to exorcise the land of this horrible nothingness that's descended upon it. He's called many times in the saga, Deliverer. He is a warrior, true, but he is also a man of extreme virtue. And he and 14 companions have sailed from their native Sweden to Denmark because they have heard of the darkness that descended upon the land and they want to altruistically do something about it. Well, you know the story as well as I do, don't you? The young man's name is Beowulf. And he does battle with this monster, this, this force of darkness named Grendel. And he slays Grendel by ripping out one of Grendel's arms. And then he goes on to likewise do battle with Grendel's mother, a witch, also a spawn of Cain, a corruption of the goodness of God's creation. And he defeats her as well. So what we've got then are two images of a stranger who is a deliverer coming into a land which is darkened with sorrow and sin and delivering the people at great cost to himself. That certainly is a Christ-like image, isn't it? And even before Beowulf arrives in Denmark, we are told that he, as it were, was baptized for seven days and seven nights. He was under the ocean, doing battle with all kinds of horrible sea creatures. So he was baptized only to emerge uh, uh, and then to uh, begin this ministry in Denmark, the slaying of wickedness, the defeat of death. Now, toward the end of his life, Beowulf, who has become famous and who has been a king in Sweden for 50 years, hears of yet another threat to innocent people. A dragon has been ravaging the countryside, and Beowulf decides that he must go and defeat the dragon as well. He takes a company of 11 trusted uh, warriors with him. Eleven, of course, gesturing at the disciples, the apostles that were left after the betrayal of Judas. But when they encounter the dragon, the eleven warriors flee. Only one remains. As we recall, only one apostle remained with Jesus on Golgotha, John, the beloved disciple. And Beowulf does battle with the dragon. But he's an old man, he's not as strong as he once was, and in the process of doing battle with the dragon, although he slays the dragon, he himself is slain. So what we've got here is the image of an individual who gives his life willingly in order to save his people from what? Well, from, again, a force of darkness that has come upon the land and is threatening to destroy innocent people. And what happens after Beowulf's death? Well, his one trustworthy companion appoints seven warriors to prepare his funeral. You may recall in the Acts of the Apostles that seven men were chosen as deacons. And when the funeral rites take place, 12 warriors circle, circle the barrow, the burial mound, once again reminding us of the 12 uh, immediate followers of Jesus. And finally, we are told by none other a person than the king of the Danes himself, Rogar, that there's something special about Beowulf's mother. Let me read this. Um, it appears around 941, line 941. This is what Rogar says. Whoever she was who brought forth this flower of manhood, meaning Beowulf, that woman can say that in her labor, the Lord of Ages bestowed a grace on her. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Did the Christian poet who put together this incredibly beautiful poem, did he intend deliberately to make Beowulf a Christ-like figure? I don't know. But it certainly is the case that he provides us with enough clues about not only Beowulf's temperament and character, but also about the external circumstances of his life to strongly lead us to that conclusion. The document then, as I said at the very beginning of my remarks, is a wonderful marriage of pagan and Christian elements. It is an artifact of two cultures that have come together and are trying to, in one way or another, um, 
allow one another to live without completely subsuming one at the expense of the other. It's a wonderful, wonderful tale, and I really do invite you to read it if you have not had a chance to do so. I would especially recommend Seamus Heaney's translation. And I can't end these remarks, my friends, without also recommending a wonderful novel based upon the Beowulf saga, uh, John Gardner's 1971 novel simply entitled Grendel. Beowulf has very little to do in this novel. The novel instead is uh, a story um, from Grendel's side. Um, it is a existential novel in which Grendel is portrayed as an alienated, lonely figure, a kind of tragic figure, which of course is not at all the Grendel of the original saga. My friends, this is Father Kerry Walters, and this has been another Holy Spirit moment. Thanks so much for watching. If you are of a mind, I invite you to subscribe to this series of reflections. Thank you so much. God bless. I'll see you soon.